Welcome back to another weekly GMBN Tech Show. Coming up on this week's show, we check out two new bikes from Vitus. Some really cool wheels that are a bit of a nod to the past from Sun Ringlay. We also have a look at some tire inserts for the in-betweeners out there. There's some great comments for a new lot, putting me straight actually. Um, and some awesome regulars from you too. Okay, now before we get things kicked off with news, I just want to talk to you about the pricing of bikes. Because mountain bikes, obviously they're not that cheap. You know, the amount of times I've been out riding and someone's asked about the cost of a bike I've been riding. And uh, you know, the typical answer you get is, oh, I could buy a car for that. And well, my answer defensively is always, well, not a very good car, to be fair. Now, not too long ago, you could either buy a great entry level bike or you could, you know, save up and buy a super high end bike. But now things are getting a bit blurred because you're starting to get bikes that offer the same thing at completely different prices. Now this is both a great thing because you can come into sport, you can work your way up with not spending as much as someone else. But also, there are other types of rider out there looking for something else, looking for something a bit more premium, something a bit more, I guess you could compare them to cars in a kind of way. Now the bike that made me think about this is something I'm putting in the news we can talk about shortly. Now the top spec of this bike retails for around 3,500 quid. Now this is a carbon frame bike with full Shimano XT transmission, Fox suspension, like really good stuff on it. Like about as good as you can get without being crazy about things. Three and a half grand is a lot of money, but actually I'm sure some of you out there will be realizing like this isn't a lot of money for what you're, what you're getting. Now if you take that same sort of blueprint of the bike on a bit of paper, not visually what it looks like, you know, on paper the specs and geometry and stuff, you could get something like a Santa Cruz Mega Tower in the same spec, and it's gonna cost you around 6,000 quid. So that's quite a difference by, you know, a long way for fundamentally something on a bit of paper, it's pretty much the same. Of course, we know it's not quite like that. And I guess comparing it to cars is kind of an obvious way that you could buy, let's just say uh, a Volkswagen Golf, yeah? So top spec version of that, it's probably around 40 grand in the UK, maybe in Pushma like that, yeah, 38, 40 grand, something like that. Whereas you could, at least on a bit of paper, buy another car from a direct sale or a cheaper brand, someone like a Kia, perhaps, or a Day, um, maybe not a Day, but a Kia do some all right cars, amazing value for money, with amazing warranties, you know, you get like seven year warranties and stuff for them. Why would you not go for something like that? At the end of the day, it's just a car. And given the fact that the Golf isn't exactly a supercar, you know, you got to weigh these things up for the massive money that you're saving. And I think some bike manufacturers out there, there's a load of them, Privateer bikes, Caliber bikes, Vitus bikes, even Nuke Proof are doing great value bikes, Bird, MTB, there's loads of brands out there offering incredible value. And they're kind of like, the B brand, you know, they're not quite the A brand out there. And there's nothing wrong with that. I think they probably make some amazing bikes. But just have a little moment to consider the more expensive options out there. So Santa Cruz, perfect example. They've been in the sport for a long time. And to a degree, they are one of the reasons we have such high-end premium super bikes out there or hyper bikes. You know, they help develop carbon technology. They pushed it on until you can get two different price points in carbon. That all came from Santa Cruz's development using the material and their rapid prototyping. All the suspension work they've done for the years, they've put all this work in, so arguably, if they didn't do all of this, obviously there's other brands have done this as well, but if they, brands like that didn't pioneer this sort of technology, you wouldn't have the opportunity for smaller, faster growing brands to be able to come in and actually get there quicker. Kind of like mountain climbing, I guess. Take someone to climb the peak uh, to show everyone else is possible. And then the others like figure out different ways of getting it done quicker. But I guess what I'm trying to say is that you can now get more bike than ever you know, for a frankly astonishing cost compared to what those true super bikes are. But this isn't to take away from those super bikes because they are something to aspire to for everyone, I'm sure. But uh, I'd love to know what you think. You know, would a bike like that Santa Cruz Mega Tower appeal to you or would you rather have the same spec and something that's on a bit of paper anyway, um, that's quite close to it for a fraction of the cost? Or would you still rather aspire? You know, like, let us know in those comments. Uh, dead interested to pick this one up. Okay, so let's hop into news and we're gonna go straight in with one of those bikes that I was just referencing. So we're taking a look at the new bikes from Vitus, the Escarp and the Summit. So here's a selection of shots on screen for you at the moment. And I think you'll agree with me, they don't look like cheap bikes. But 
let's have a closer look and you can decide for yourselves. So there's two options out there. So the Summit to start with comes in 27 and a half and 29 inch versions. Uh, this is it, you can see on screen there's a variety of different colors and specs which I'm gonna tell you a bit about. So the 27 and a half has 170 mil travel, the 29 slightly less at 162. Obviously you've got to accommodate those wheels in the frame. Now this is focused for enduro and free ride. Geometry on this, right, so there's four sizes, 64 degree head angle on all sizes in both wheel sizes. Reach on them, slightly different between different wheel sizes. 424 to 504 on the small wheels, really good sizing. Uh, and 418 to 498 on the 29s, also really good sizing. Change stage 435 or 440 in millimeters, so that is really good, different wheel size, different change stage. And then the seat angle change, changes between sizes as well. Uh, nothing to do with the wheel size here. This is uh, size specific. So the smaller sizes are nearer to 76 and a half. The larger sizes, 77 and a half. So um, really progressively sized bikes, really. Now the pricing, this is where they get cool. So the cheapest model comes with a RockShox Yari, 170 mil, this is it on screen. Super Deluxe Shock, Dior 12 speed on there. WTB wheels, and it's even got Asagai and Mini and DHR2 tires on it for 2,399 quid in the UK. So that's about 2,800 euros or 3,000 US dollars. So that is a hell of a bike for the money. It really is. Now it's got really good suspension platform. We're gonna talk about this in a second because uh, both this and this Scarp share a similar frame layout, but they just have different intentions. Uh, but the top spec version of this retails for about 3,600 quid, which is $4,500 or 4,200 euros. That's got Fox 38 Grip 2 on it, Fox DHX2 Shock, uh, Shimano XT 12 speed, DT 17 M1700 wheels, and Asgai Minion tires on there for three and a half grand. Like, that is just mind-blowingly good, and let alone when you find out the rest about the actual frame. But having just got, you know, having just bought a frame from the Far East and just kitted it out with really good spec, it's a really good frame as well. Now, I can't emphasize that enough. Uh, just a quick bit about this Scarp, the shorter travel version of essentially the same bike, 27 and a half and 29 inch versions, 140 mil travel, aimed at the all mountain sort of category. Again, four sizes, slightly steeper, 65 degree as opposed to 64 degree. Uh, the reach is similar, 430 to 510 and 437 to 505 for 27 and a half and 29 respectively. Hopefully that's not too complicated. Uh, chain stays are the same, 435 and 440 on the two different wheel sizes. And again, the seat angle gets steeper with the bigger sizes. We've seen this on Newproof and we've seen this with other brands recently, uh, from 77 to 78 degrees, uh, depending on the size. Four sizes there, um, brilliant stuff. Now, slightly cheaper on this, a little less travel, so the components like the forks are slightly cheaper accordingly. The base model, 1,999 in UK, so that's 2,399 euros or 2,499 US dollars. Uh, these bikes ship everywhere, by the way. They're distributed by Chain Reaction and uh, Wiggle. It's got Marzocchi Z2 on it, a RockShox Deluxe Shock, Shimano Dior 12 speed, WTB wheels, Maxxis, Azagai, and Dissector tires. Ridiculous, like ridiculous. Two grand gets you that. That's just unbelievable for the money. Now also, the top end of the spec, three and a half grand. Um, in fact, the other one was slightly more. This is three and a half grand, uh, 4,000 euros, 4,200 US dollars. Uh, it's got Fox 36, Float DPX, uh, DPS even, if we can get my words out. Shimano Dior 12 speed, uh, sorry, Dior XT 12 speed. DT M1700 wheels, and again, the Maxxis combination of tires there. Astonishing value. But this is where it gets cool, because it's not just an average frame, like I was saying. So it's got T700 carbon, like Toure carbon, front triangle, 6061 aluminium rear triangle, so uh, saving basically on a bit of cost there, but also, yeah, actually, it's a good, good thing to have an aluminium rear triangle because they tend to be the stuff if you're going to thrash the pants up a bike, that's where you're going to get damage on it first. So uh, flip chip for adjustable geometry on them. The seat tube, this is cool. So on all sizes, they've got, again, the maximum amount of dropper seat posts you can possibly get in there. So on a size small, you can fit a 150 mil drop post and the XL, you can fit a 200 mil. So that is awesome. So they're trying to cater for everyone like that might want to upsize, but also get the maximum drop posts. As we know, bike sizing and length is far more relevant for off-road bikes. So that's really cool. They've all got the SRAM UDH hanger on there, so it's the universal derailleur hanger. Bravo, the more people that can use it, the better, because it's a pain in the ass for anyone having to try and find a random mech hanger and they snap it off at their season in Morzine, like, so sorted. 
really good. Uh, big tire clearance up to 2.6 on the 27.5 and 2.5 on the 29s. Uh, bigger bearings for better durability, easy bearings to change. Now the suspension curve is slightly improved from the previous model they say. They say it's a bit straighter and just ramps up a little bit so it can work really well with coil shocks now but it also means it's better for air shocks so you can tune it a bit better rather than having these sort of strange humps in that travel. Uh, they've lowered the anti-squat so uh, what they believe, in fact new proof are the same, they've got the same theory on this that they um, rightly so believe that less anti-squat is actually better because you have too much anti-squat the bike feels a bit a bit rigid a bit chattery on stuff so they've lowered the anti-squat in the higher gears where you're tend to be pedaling out but in the lower gears where you're climbing they've got a slightly more increased anti-squat so it's going to sit up a bit and not sort of suffer with a suspension bob there so really cool um, it's got quite a bit of anti-rise on there so the bike's not going to really pitch forwards uh, but it's not got too much so it's going to ruin things on that bike so um, and it's got clear frame protection just like the new proof bikes do as standard now it won't be as much on there as a full kit like from one of the brands like Invisi frame but it comes with clear protection as standard. Come on other brands, take note of this. Why would you not do this on your lovely carbon fiber front triangles that chip oh so easily? Uh, brilliant value for money, uh, bravo to Vitus Bikes. Uh, let us know what you think in those comments. There's loads of shots here, they sent us loads of cool shots. And that's also the way to launch a bike. Do a great bike with great ergonomics, great sizing, great suspension kinematics, and great images for everyone to see how good they are. Uh, go and check them out, awesome stuff. Right, okay, next up, uh, Vittoria. We obviously run Vittoria tires here at GMBN. This is a bit of a no man's land still. The gravel route, the in-betweeners. So they're both that suit us because I know loads of friends that ride gravel bikes, uh, including Blake, he's got a gravel bike, really likes it. Um, and now it means he can ride a gravel bike without slashing his rear tires constantly because he does things on his gravel bike that you really shouldn't. People kind of forget they're not a mountain bike, they're a gravel bike. Anyhow, they now make their tire liners for gravel bikes. Uh, so they're suitable for rims up to 25 mil wide. Uh, you can cut them down basically so they can fit 27 halves um, if you really want them to, or the bigger 700c size or 29 inch wheel size. Now the good thing about these is they help absorb impact, so they do help protect your rim and that. But ultimately, the thing that's different about the airliners compared to other tight inserts like a Cush Core, for example, A, they're a fraction of the cost, B, they're easy to fit, very easy to fit by comparison, but they don't quite do the same thing. Now this is important to say. The cool thing about these is they're, be they're designed to run flat. So if you do get a puncture or slash your tire, in that section of the trail where you could damage your rim normally or damage your tire more, it enables you to keep riding basically until you can get somewhere to fix it. Or if you're in a race situation, say you're in a cross country race or you're, you know, you're in a gravel race, whatever, it means that you can finish what you're doing without having to sort of risk the bike yourself. And it's a little bit different to Cush Core, whereas Cush Core actually helps hold the tire onto the rim itself. It helps provide a bit more progression to the actual feel of the tire as well, almost like an air volume spacer for your tires. And now Cush Core is amazing, not muddy in that for sure, but it's a very different thing to this. This is a much lighter, much different solution uh, for a different type of rider. So there's some shots of it on screen. Now they obviously do these in mountain bike sizes, which we've been playing with on Jimby. In fact, I've not actually told anyone this, but we've had them for a while and we've been using them. I use them on the rear end of my Canyon Lux actually because I'm on the upper end really of what you should be running on a bike like that. So I'm about 200 pounds and running on a super lightweight cross-country bike with cross-country wheels and the cross-country tires. Now I'm pretty sure I would have slashed the rear tire by now. Uh, this is nothing about the quality of the tire, it's just a super thin tire. And I have been running some of those inserts just to help me on the way so I can keep my pressure a little bit lower. Seem to work all right for me. So um, there you go. Well, there's some options for you now if you're at gravel and you want to protect your rims and keep your tire pressures down a little bit more. Um, now, the durability is something interesting. So Victoria say the polymeric material of airliner gravel is extremely durable. In normal conditions, it lasts 2,000 hours of use or one hour if you can run it completely flat. Obviously, if you run, you run your tires completely flat, you're just gonna be toasting it with the rims and the rocks and stuff, but you could ride for an hour on this. That's pretty good going, I think. Okay, next up is a chain tool from KMC. Now, this really isn't a tool for everyone out there because a regular chain measuring device is all you need for checking if your chain is worn. But look at this. Comes in a little case, and it's a digital chain checker. <laughs> Look at that bad boy. So this thing is pretty accurate, um, ridiculously accurate in fact. Now it's designed to check the wear on your chain. Essentially that's what you use it for and this is for the mechanic that has all of the tools in the world that really needs one of these. Now it's super cool so it goes, you know, they say recommendation for their chains is a 0.80 of millimetre so 
some people say it's a bit lax, some go with 0.5, um, but that's up to you. But the point is that you can check it on one of these. And as you can see, if I, oops, it's focusing on my head then. Go on, focus on here. Pretty accurate reading just by squashing it in there. Again, this really is a tool for the person that's got everything or for the bike shop that really needs to justify to those somewhat annoying customers sometimes that don't believe them that their chain or their transmission is worn because it's really important to replace your chain as soon as you can. Now, if you're not sure of why this is, it's because chains stretch, right? Yeah, that sounds misleading, doesn't it? Like the chain doesn't physically stretch, your chain links will not stretch. But what does happen is you've got your outer plates, your inner plates, you have the pin that goes to the middle and you have the roller that rotates around the pin. That's a bit you need to loop. Now those rollers, as they're moving around, they actually sort of bore out a bit on the inside. They get a bit baggy. Yeah, and that effectively enables the pitch of the links to change slightly. So the, the pitch of a chain is measured from the center of a pin to the center of a pin. Now, if they're unable to get slightly baggy, those rollers aren't gonna be rolling correctly on your sprocket, so on your chain ring or on your rear cassette. Now, if they're not completely in the trough, they're gonna be pushing on one side, yeah? So they're gonna wear those components out faster. That's why it's important to replace your chain as soon as it shows signs of, signs of wear, and it will save you money. So, brilliant piece of kit. Of course, this one is perhaps a step too far for some people, but nonetheless, I'm sure some of you wanna know about this because it's extremely accurate. And as far as I know, it's the only digital chain checker on the market. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. I've not seen any other ones, uh, and I think it's an awesome bit of kit. Simples. Okay, I just want to throw up a few Instagram things that I've seen actually in the last few days. Now, the first one is I'm going to throw you over to Jeff Steber. So he's Mr. Intense Bikes to you or I. Um, obviously, he prefers his name, Jeff Steber. Now, his Instagram handle is on the screen. Give him a follow. This guy is super cool. And you know what? He really does love making bikes. Now, this latest post about making a hardtail is a perfect example of why Jeff is someone that's really cool to follow on Instagram for bike tech. Now, everything he does is a labor of love. He still does all of the rapid prototyping with aluminum bikes, rapid prototypes and stuff. He does them himself. You know, he doesn't have a factory make this stuff. He doesn't do it any other way. He has his own little R&D section. I've seen him, he made me a bike. In fact, the print of it is up there somewhere, you can see it, that one there. Um, it's amazing, and on this post here, he's just talking about building a hardtail, and I just think it's cool as anything. So give him a follow if you don't already follow him. Now next up is Brendan Fairclough's new bike. Yeah, okay, so at a glance, it looks quite nice, and then you look a bit closer, then you realize, ooh, it's an e-bike. Is Doddy gonna start talking about e-bikes on GMN 10? I don't know. You tell me. Um, the thing I'm struggling with at the moment is genuinely, everything's getting a bit closer. All of the top pros are now riding e-bikes as well. Now this bike, you can't deny it, the e-ransom, it looks awesome, an awesome bike. Whether you want an e-bike or not, you can still appreciate the form of a bike. I'm sure you can. Uh, this was built by his friends over at MB Cyclery in Hasselmere in Surrey. Uh, awesome bike shop, if you're ever in the area there, uh, pop in and see him. Super friendly guys, great shop, and they really know their stuff as well. But what do you think about e-bike tech? Bearing in mind that GMBN Tech is here to provide all the tech information to go alongside GMBN. EMBN hasn't really got its own tech channel, so should we be covering some of that stuff or should they be supersizing some of the, the tech stuff dedicated on there? Now, don't be too harsh in the comments about e-bikes. They're still just bikes at the end of the day, but uh, genuinely interested. Um, I'm not trying to play with fire here. Right, next one is this S-Works bike on the Olin page. Oh my God, look at it. Look at the build on this. I mean, Olin stuff is drool worthy anyway, but I think that one is just awesome. Uh, Olin's MTB making loads of cool stuff. Uh, we referred to something that was on Loke Bruni's bike last week actually on the show, that little carbon shroud hiding something from Olin. So keep an eye on their Instagram page because you might see something in the coming weeks, but um, super cool anyway. Okay, and the last thing in news are the Sun Ringlay Super Bubba hubs and wheel sets. Well, I really want to talk about hubs, but they're part of this new wheel set. So well, it's actually not a new wheel set. This is the limited edition wheel set. So the Duroc Pro SD37 wheels, right? So you'd be right in thinking 37 means they're 37 millimeters external, uh, 32 internal, I think, yep. And they're available in 27 and and 29. So weights for them, front wheel weight is 940 grams, um, in 27 and a half, 933 in 29, rear wheel is 1,108, uh, and 1,156 in 27 and a half and 29. 
Now the way it's aside, we can look at the actual hubs, which is a super cool bit. Right, so they're laced up with Will Smith straight pull spokes. Will Smith spokes, really, really good spokes, by the way. Now the hubs are the cool thing. So they've got an adjustable ratchet on them. Uh, we're gonna ignore the color for the time being, but they're the Clock D adjustable ratchet system. So you can have either four or six degrees between rotation, depending on your preferences. Now, why would you wanna do that? Well, some people like the feeling of a fast pickup on hubs, but also some bikes in the rear suspension, you can actually feel the difference between them. You can actually feel suspension, almost want to ratchet things along. It's partly one of the reasons I'm, I'm confused by some hubs out there that have virtually zero degrees on them. Uh, I'm not sure why you would want that on a lot of bike designs out there. Yeah, cool, they feel mega when they do pick up, of course, because it's literally virtually instant, and they sound insane as well, but these are really cool. So on screen, you can see some shots of them. And the ones you're looking at come in the 3D Violet Anodized. Now these are a bit of a nod back to the Sun Ringlay Super Bubba hubs from the 90s, and they were something special back then. So I have high hopes for these. Now they come with an XD driver body and also a micro spline body. As far as I know, you can also fit a traditional spline, but if you're getting these, you're probably quite up to date with stuff. So that means XD or micro spline to be fair. They, they look really cool. Um, I love the fact that you can change the ratchet system on them. I've not seen this before. Um, I'd like to have a little play with them. As far as I know, you can just offset the ratchet rings on the inside and that changes how much rotation you can have between uh, the pickup points. I think that's really cool. Uh, if anyone's got a set, let us know. Uh, let us know what they sound like as well because I can't find anything to hear what they sound like. I love the sound of a good hub. Also, kind of like a silent hub as well sometimes because uh, when you ride those trails that you possibly shouldn't be on. Um, otherwise, it means you've got a pedal everywhere or someone's gonna hear you. But uh, right, we're just gonna move straight on to rewind here because I wanna show you some shots of the original versions of these hubs just to show you where they got the idea of putting them in purple. Purple nowadays might be frowned upon, but I'm gonna bring it back a little bit, I hope, on my bike that's just over there out of shot at the moment. But here's the old ones. So this is on a Yeti Arc full suspension bike, it used to belong to Missy Jovi. It's from 1991, this bike. And the shots actually were provided to me by Pete Drew. He's an amazing photographer, so just a big up to Pete. Now look at the hubs. I mean, it's a Yeti, so if this was on a dirt shed show, it would be getting a super nice straight out. But just look at the bike. How nice is this with a Manatee suspension on there, all of the Purple and Dirt stuff, and those Super Bubba hubs. Uh, man, they were seriously nice back in the day, along with their, their seat post. I think it was called the Moby post on it, where it had a single bolt. It had like a clamp that uh, the saddle rail clamp used to revolve and had a single wrap around it with one bolt. Really cool design, nice and sleek. They had the Zuki or the Zook stem, which is really, really nice. Big billet aluminium machined into a kind of cool shape. They had all sorts of stuff they had there. Um, I've forgotten the name of their, the bolt cage was called H2O. And then they also had their quick release levers with the holes milled through them as well. Super cool brand back then. So I'm really pleased to see those Duroc Pro SD37 wheels back. High hopes for those. I think they could be really cool as well. So nice and light and also really durable too. Okay, so let's take a little look at comments from last week's show. Now, I'm kind of really enjoying this because I look through the comments anyway, but it's actually kind of nice to be able to read some of these out because uh, uh, some people kind of correct me, which is cool, I like that, put me in my place, I don't mind that, it's all good. And other people bring stuff up that I hadn't thought of. So in last week's show, I was basically talking about downhill bikes, and yes, they are amazing, don't, don't get it wrong into the stick here. But I was just thinking, are they kind of pointless for a lot of people? So uh, PC says, well, as for reference to Formula One, the tech trickles down a mountain bike too. Would you ever see enduro bikes with 160 to 180 mil of travel, crazy geometry, great tires, if it wasn't for downhill bikes? Also pedals, armor, helmet, helmets, the list goes on. Uh, yeah, I completely agree with you. 100% loads of technology does come from there. But also there's a lot of technology that comes from the cross country end, which is often not really sort of thought about or considered. Uh, but yeah, 100%, I agree with you there, because I obviously referenced Formula One in there. Um, next up is from Kieran Herbert. Downhill bikes are cool, they always have been. Enduro bikes are great for most things for average riding ability though. Uh, yeah, they are, 100%, totally agree with that. Lister Welsh. Downhill bikes are a massive waste of cash. Ooh, straight in with a kick to the teeth there. Um, if you don't live next to Whistler, if you don't live next door to Whistler or race downhill, there's no point whatsoever in having one. One of my friends forked out over four grand for a nuke proof descent. 
Literally all he can do is ride downhill on it. He pushes it up every hill and he can't go on a ride with us, ends up borrowing my, one of my spare bikes. Now he's trying to sell it and guess what? No one wants to buy it. He'll have to take a massive loss on it or just credit card another bike. Yeah, I, I completely see the point. If anyone out there is in the market for a downhill bike, let us know, that'd be interesting. You know, what are your reasons? Are you a racer or do you just really want one? I think down and bikes are really cool, but I kind of do still agree with that, that sentiment. Like, if you live somewhere where you can really ride one, then great, like, awesome, enjoy it. Like Joe B's, he says, Forrester Dean is my local, and I ride a downhill bike there all the time. Personally, I find it easier to ride fast and pull huge hucks as it's more confidence inspiring, but the push-up does suck. Yeah, I completely agree, but if you live there, then you'll probably get more out of it because you know all the best trails to ride on it as well. And also, by living there, you'll probably... I'm taking a wild guess here that you probably wouldn't mind pushing your bike up five or six times, doing a few runs. Whereas if you're, say, if you're me and you drive there, I want to get in as many runs as possible uh, in the short space of time I've got. And you don't always get a good run and you feel a bit ripped off if you've got to push back up again for another run that you don't know. Um, I think it's amazing that you ride. I see loads of rippers riding uh, some of the more off PC stuff there on downhill bikes. I guess you're probably one of them. But um, yeah, good for you. But yeah, pushing up hills does suck. But there is something else to be said for that, actually. A lot of people push up the fire roads, but you shouldn't technically push up any sort of trail that's got a, a way of looking. Um, <laughs> a one-way trail, for example, is what I'm trying to say here, if I can get my words out. But the sort of the art of sessioning has kind of been lost with modern trail centers and bikes because you kind of just do laps. That's great because you learn in a different way, but I also, one of the things I used to like about downhill bikes was when pushing back up, you start seeing different lines that you wouldn't necessarily see when you're riding down. So you're session a section, and then the next time you do a full run, it's already imprinted on your brain. Um, so there is actually something really good to say about them. Uh, next is from uh, Brett 020. 0206, I guess, uh, four days ago, he says, all in one word there. Uh, I live 300 meters from the Mount Seymour Trailhead on the North Shore. I'm very envious of you. What a lovely place to live and what amazing trails you have on your doorstep. Almost everyone I see is on trail enduro bikes. Useful, but pretty ordinary. The coolest things I've seen are a few all mountain hardtails um, and one old school warrior on a fully rigid bike. Ooh, crazy. I wouldn't ride a rigid bike there. A few triple crown downhill rigs here and there uh, turn heads, but I'd say they're pretty cool. Cool and practical and not the same, obviously. Yeah, I've ridden downhill bikes there in the past and I've actually found you ground out on them quite a lot in some of the places and the angles aren't, you know, it's good for the slower trails. There's a lot of slower technical stuff there as well, but uh, yeah, always good. Wow, okay, and then the next one is from Cup and Cone. Are downhill bikes really the Formula One of mountain biking? Because last time I checked, it was downhill was always slow to adopt new technology compared to the XC trail piers. Oh, here we go, this is good. Downhill was reluctant to ride tubeless tires for the longest time, so they said they weren't durable. Downhill was reluctant to use air suspension for the longest time, because so they said it would blow out compared to springs. Downhill was reluctant to use 650B and 29er wheels for the longest time, because so they said it was uncontrollable. Should I continue? Very good point, Cup and Cone. I'm gonna leave it right there. And now it's time for top mods. Now this is all about the modifications you make to your bike. And what is a modification? Well, literally anything that makes your bike a bit different to how it came when you got the bike. Or ideally, a load of customization to make your bike even better and different to all your mates ones. Now, same thing applies. There's a link to our uploader there and another one in the description. And we're gonna jump straight in with this really nice looking heart out. So this is a white 905. So these are from the UK, British brand, uh, quite progressive in their geometry. And you can see that by the length of the dropper post in there and how low the seat tube is in relation to how long the front end is. Like really decent bikes. If you've not heard of them, check them out. Well worth a look. Anyhow, this is from Peter. He says it's my white 905 2021, so smoking new, um, legendary British hardtail from Berkshire. I bought this new bike in lockdown. Running down hills was no fun. Yeah, absolutely. Bikes, you know, you're supposed to run away from things. You're not supposed to run for the fun of things. Um, I've upgraded the brakes. Now got SRAM code R's on there. <whistles> Very nice. Uh, new grips, DMR death grips, 200 mil front rotor, Deity T-Mac flat pedals. Amazing improvements to an amazing bike. Flat pedals that look perfect on there. Look at the color coordination on those. That's great. That's really good. I'll tell you what, there's a few brands out there doing some nice anodized green stuff. You can get some green valve stems that look pretty sick on that bike. I think there's a few brands out there. Like Markov do loads of colored ones, PTs do loads of colored ones as well. Also worth looking at Bergtex, they do loads of spacers and stuff 
for your uh, your stem so you get matching green ones on there and go to whole hog but looking awesome so far sorry i'm just trying to tell you to spend more money here uh, the death grips look good i like the flangeless death grips i've got to say um i heard someone griping about those the other day saying what's the point but i think they're better to be honest you've got better access to the shifter but your bike looks awesome and loads of great pictures of it as well i can tell it's your pride and joy because the amount of pictures you've taken pretty much from the same angles but uh oh look at that one in the sun that looks great it's a nice looking bike that who's a hardtail lover out there everyone hardtail lovers or do people prefer full sus uh pick up in a conversation because we've got another hardtail here and this is another progressive looking hardtail this one's from uh roman in around switzerland so Roman has a 2018 YT Capra 29XL and a 2020 NS Bikes Eccentric Alu Evo 29. So that is what we're looking at here. I built up some new wheels for my YT Capra with completely silent Ongs Vespa hubs, DT Swiss spokes and nipples, and cheap Chinese carbon rims from Nexty, using this video from Ali Clarkson. Yeah, Ali making these, making some decent videos. Yeah, well worth a watch. Now, around the old E13 wheel set, it built up a hardtail enduro bike with an NS Bikes Eccentric 29er frame. So that's what you're looking at here. With a 150mm Lyric, a used one. Brilliant, great way to save a bit of cash. Easily serviceable fork. Yeah, that's a really good point, actually. Buying second-hand suspension forks is a really good thing to do. Obviously, you want to check the condition of the stanchions. If they've been run dry or they've not been looked after, you could have some anodizing wear. If they look good, then most things on them can be replaced and fixed and serviced and make them feel like new. So you can snap up a bargain but one thing to really take into account if you're buying a second hand suspension fork is check the steerage tube length i know so many people who've bought forks where the steerage has been too short for their bike and it's just been a waste of money uh, definitely allow yourself enough room for you know room for error basically because you don't want to be running the front end too low you also can get around this to a degree with a different bar rise if you're running a low rise bar you can go up like 20, sometimes 30 mil in rise in a bar, so you can compensate slightly, but uh, just something to be aware of there. But the bike looks awesome. And um, the Capra also got a one-up dropper in the 210 mil length. Yeah, that's the full length. But uh, I'm liking the hardtail. Those lyrics look really good on it. Nice and slack up the front end there. Looks mega. Decent Maxxis tires. The dropper post looks great because it doesn't even look like a drop post. I love that when you've got like the full length of the dropper post and the rest is all slammed in the frame. So it just looks neat and tidy. Kind of like what you're seeing on those BMC bikes where they've got an integrated dropper. And I do think that will be the future where you'll have one as part of the frame as standard. Now it just seems common sense to me. But um, your bike looks amazing. And I love that last shot with the locker pile in the back there. Very cool. Awesome stuff. So keep those top mods coming in. We'll see you next week. There we go, there's the end of this week's tech show. Hopefully you enjoyed some of the news and that topic about the bikes getting cheaper. Or certainly you're getting a lot more bike for the money in some cases. I'd love to know what you think about the division between, you know, bikes that basically have the same spec on paper. One costs a lot of money and the other is actually relatively good value for money. Definitely pick that one up. I'm keen to hear what you think about that. Perhaps there's a video on that. We can look at what the real differences are. But uh, as always, thank you for hanging around and we'll see you next week. See you later.